We're uh, in the fourth week of a series on pursuit, pursuing. Uh, pursue is our word. Um, we've talked about that. It goes to Philippians 3.14, that I pursue this one thing. I pursue the calling that God, the heavenly calling that God has placed in my life. So we're, we're, we're using pursue as our word because we want to focus. We're talking about a lot of things that you can focus on. The question is, what are you individually as a follower of Jesus going to focus on this year? What are you going to pursue? What is in your goal what is in your calling that God has placed in your life for you to pursue? And then collectively as a church, we're pursuing those things together. And then today is, is another thing that, that we should pursue, that we can pursue, that we need to focus on. We're talking about pursuing prayer today. Um, it's a subject that we can talk about every week because I don't know about you, but, but I feel like it's an area that I can always grow in. Um, I know that uh, I feel this way, I know many of you feel this way, that through Brother Clayton's leadership over 10 years, my prayer life grew under his leadership um, to areas that I didn't understand it could before him, uh, before his leadership, and uh, I'm thankful for that. But it's, it's an area where we struggle, I think, sometimes, especially as men. I feel like as men, we struggle in this area. You know, if, we're, if something's going on, we don't want our name on the prayer list, we want to tough it out, right? If something's going on, we don't want people knowing about it. We might pray about it a little bit, but let's not make it a big public thing. Let's not get the church involved because that looks like I can't handle something, which is the entire point of prayer is that you and I can't handle this life on our own. But for some reason, we are very, very stubborn in that fact, and we want to try. So we're talking about pursuing prayer today through promises. We need to pray. We must pray. But I want us to to focus in and to pursue the thought of praying with God's promises in mind. And we'll be looking uh, at a passage of Scripture there in 2 Samuel that will kind of help us do that. Uh, this quote here, nothing uh, ground-shaking, but it just kind of hit me as I was preparing for this for today. It says, What a man is on his knees before God, that he is, and nothing more. Our prayer life, how we pray, when we pray, how often we pray, the depth of our prayer life, explains us as people and explains what we truly care about as much or more than anything all right so we're digging in uh to a, a lengthy piece of scripture uh we're going to dig into some specifics of this but but we're going to read the whole thing to kind of get the idea this is in second samuel so this is as david has become king okay so it's not exactly a thousand bc but that's an easy number i i I've, I've placed david at a thousand bc in my mind i say that often to, to you because it helps. It's an easy number to remember. 3,000 years ago, okay? That's when David was reigning as the king in Israel. Close enough. You give a few years, but it's close enough. So we're about 3,000 years ago. David is reigning as the king of Israel, the first God-appointed king of Israel. Saul was the first king, but he was man-appointed. That was who Israel wanted. David is who God wanted, and David is, has gone through quite the transformation in his life. He's gone from the shepherd boy to the warrior, army leader, to the grown, mature leader king of Israel. That's where he is in this place, in this part of Scripture. And he is, we are picking up right after David's biggest failure. It is a huge failure in David's life. Many of you, well, you know exactly what I'm talking about. David um, got a little complacent in his life and in his leadership as the king of Israel. And as he was leading at a time when he should have been off being the king, being the leader, being uh, the warrior that he was, he stayed back. And then as he stayed back and didn't have to do what he needed to normally do, he had a little extra time on his hands, too much time on his hands. I know you've heard that idle hands on the devil's playground, right? And he's looking around, and he sees this beautiful woman. And he says, i got to have her, Okay. Scripture has a word for that. It's called covet. David, in, this, in the next few events that take place, the next several decisions that he makes, it breaks four of the Ten Commandments in one event. I, I've, I've never really thought about that until preparing for this, that, that four of the Ten Commandments, David, he just destroys here. He covets. He takes another man's wife. He sees Bathsheba, and he says, i got to have her. And so he has her. He brings her. He has her brought to the to the 
to the palace, to the, to the, uh, the king's home, and he commits adultery with her. Her husband is off fighting for David and for Israel and is a trusted friend of David. And, and we read that scripture and we think, how can you do that? And then just come back to reality and say, we still do it to this day. <laughs> they just didn't write a Bible about us. They didn't write a scripture about us. But people, that still happens on a regular basis this day because when it comes to that area of life, we're, we're capable of just about anything and justifying just about anything. And David, he does that. But he doesn't stop there, right? We know that. He doesn't stop there. That would have been bad enough to take another man's wife while he's off fighting a war. But then what happens? She was pregnant. Uh-oh. Now we can't hide it. Thought I could just get away with it. Now we can't hide it. So what are we going to do? Well, David, in his infinite wisdom, says, well, I'll just bring Uriah back. Uriah the Hittite. I'll bring Bathsheba's husband back. I'll get him a little liquored up. I'll send him home. He has, he's been away at war. Surely he'll go home and, and they'll be together. And then we can just pretend that it's their baby. Well, Uriah, being a much more, at this point in his life, righteous man than David, says, I can't do that. My brothers are fighting a war, King David. So, I, so he sleeps basically on the steps of the palace. Right? He doesn't go home and be with his wife, which he was given the permission to do from the king. So now David is like, two O's. Okay, now what am I going to do? Well, hmm. Well, I'll just kill him. I'll just have him killed. I'll commit murder. I, I'm not going to stop at coveting and lying. I'll just go on and I'll just go on and go to murder. Let's just skip to that. And so what does he do? You know what he does. He, he sends word for Uriah to be placed on the front lines of the battle. Right? David doesn't actually stab him with the sword and kill him, but he's responsible for him being killed. He puts him on the front lines, and Uriah dies in battle. And now David can take Uriah in, or excuse me, can take Bathsheba in and, and be the savior, right? be the king, be the, be the hero of the story. He's, he's taking care of this poor woman that has now lost her husband in battle. And David thinks, like you and I think, he thinks he's gotten away with it. He thinks it's over with, and it's done, and he's moving forward, and he's pretty good. He's pretty smart. He's pretty wise. He's pretty shifty and shrewd in the way he's handled all this, and nobody even knows, and he got another beautiful wife out of the deal. He's feeling pretty good about what's taking place, and at that point is where we pick up today in chapter 12, okay? And as we pick this up, for those of you that don't know this story, Nathan is the prophet. So Nathan is the, quote, man of God, okay? I, I'm nothing anywhere near to Nathan, but to give you a modern-day equivalent, it'd be like the pastor showing up on your doorstep saying, we got to talk, right? It's the, it's, you know, you feel like you're going to, like Doug said the other day, like you're going to the principal's office, okay? So that's where David is right now, but Nathan is a pretty wise man of God, and he kind of sets a little trap here for David. We're picking up the first verse in chapter 12. It says, so the Lord, <laughs> see that? So the Lord sent Nathan to David. When he arrived, he said to him, there were two men in a certain city, one rich and the other poor. The rich man had a large number of sheep and cattle, but the poor man had nothing except one small ewe lamb that he had bought. He raised it, and it grew up, living with him and his children. It shared his meager food and drank from his cup. It slept in his arms, and it was like a daughter to him. Now a traveler came to the rich man, but the rich man could not bring himself to take one of his own sheep or cattle, to prepare for the traveler who had come to him. Instead, he took the poor man's lamb and prepared it for his guests. David was infuriated with the man and said to Nathan, As the Lord lives, the man who did this deserves to die because he has done this wrong and shown no pity. He must pay four lambs for that lamb. Nathan replied to David, You are the man. This is what the Lord, God of Israel, says. I anointed you king over Israel, and I delivered you from the hand of Saul. I gave you your master's house to you and your master's wives into your arms, and I gave you the house of Israel and Judah. And if that was not enough, I would have given you even more. Why then have you despised the command of the Lord by doing what I consider evil? You struck down Uriah the Hittite with the sword and took his wife as your own. You murdered him with the Ammonite's sword. Now, therefore, the sword will never leave your house because you despised me 
and took the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your own wife. This is what the Lord says. I'm going to bring disaster on you from your own family. I will take your wives and give them to another before your very eyes, and he will sleep with them publicly. You acted in secret, but I will do this before all Israel and in broad daylight. Verse 13, David responded to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. Then Nathan replied to David, The Lord has taken away your sin. You will not die. However, because you treated the Lord with such contempt in this matter, the son born to you will die. Then Nathan went home. The Lord struck the baby that Uriah's wife had born to David, and he became ill. David pleaded with God for the boy. He fasted, went home, and spent the night lying on the ground. The elders of his house stood beside him to get him up from the ground, but he was unwilling and would not eat anything with them. On the seventh day, the baby died. But David's servants were afraid to tell him the baby was dead. They said, look, while the baby was alive, we spoke to him, and he wouldn't listen to us. So how can we tell him that the baby is dead? He may do something desperate. When David saw that his servants were whispering to each other, he guessed that the baby was dead. So he asked his servants, is the baby dead? He is dead, they replied. Then David got up from the ground. He washed, anointed himself, changed his clothes, went to the Lord's house and worshiped. Then he went home and requested something to eat. So they served him food and he ate. Whew, that's a lot. <laughs> it's a pretty heavy story. I mean, honestly, it's a pretty difficult story. Um, I had the unfortunate uh, responsibility to perform a uh, infant funeral uh, during this past year. And this was the passage that we looked at. Uh, and, and it was difficult. And, um, but I think in this today, we can find some principles to pull out and some hope uh, in this story, even as difficult as it is. So David's going to lose his son, right? Now, Nathan comes to David with a word from God. And he kind of lays this trap out for David. You go back to verse 5, and David says that he was infuriated with the man. He said to Nathan that he was infuriated with the man, and that as the Lord lives, this man should die. He should die for the sin that he has committed. He should die for the, quote, law that he has broken. And how do we know that he's broken a law? And how do we know that David knew he had broken a law? Because he gives the law's answer to what the man did, that he should die. But then he says he must pay four lambs for that lamb. See, David knew the law. He knew that by basically stealing this lamb from this guy, right, this is not justice, like we talked about a couple weeks ago. This rich man that has plenty could give this guy a lamb or a goat or whatever, Nah, not enough. I'm going to take this one from this guy who only has one. David says that's theft in God's eyes. And then if you steal, then you should give back fourfold. David, catch that, knows the law. He knows what he's supposed to do. He just hadn't been doing it. And David just, I mean, and Nathan just, I mean, he just set it up perfectly, right? I mean, just a perfect bump set, come down with a spike. And he comes down with a spike after David basically condemns his own, his, his own self. Nathan says, you are the man. Think about that. You know what that feeling feels like. When you've messed up, you've acted like you hadn't messed up, but then you are just caught red-handed. Think about being David in this position, right? Nathan, prophet of God, man of God, comes to you and, and, and sets you up, and, and you think you're proficient to perform justice on this nasty, wicked man who's done this awful thing to this poor man who didn't have anything, and then David, or excuse me, then Nathan flips the mirror around. Isn't that what the Word of God does? It's like, I mean, it's a mirror right back in your face. It's a sword that just slices us right open, if we allow it, and shows us just how wicked and hopeless we are. And that's what Nathan did. He said, do you think it's that guy? Let me turn it around. You are the man. You are this guy. You had all the wives you needed. 
You had all the stuff you needed. You had everything you could possibly want. It wasn't enough. You had to have one more, just like this rich guy. He had all the lambs he could possibly have, but it wasn't enough. He wanted one more lamb, and David wanted one more beautiful woman in his house that he could take, that he could take for his own. And Nathan reminds him after going through all this, he's, here's all the things I've given you, right? And he says, and if that wasn't enough, God speaking through Nathan, through Nathan, I would have given you even more. <laughs> if that wasn't enough, David, I would have given you more. All you had to do was ask. Remember, we're talking about prayer this morning. I know you're thinking, when are we going to get to the prayer? We're getting to the prayer, I promise. We're getting there. So, you, you didn't lack, David. You didn't lack. You had no reason to do this. No justifiable human reason to do this. And you know what's right, as you just condemn yourself by expressing what the law would say to do to a person like this. And the interesting thing, side note, just a little trivia thing, the punishment that David gets put on him, is fourfold. Okay? That doesn't have anything to do with today, but go back and check it. The punishment that gets put on him is fourfold. God's law, not one jot and tittle, will be gone, uh, go away. So, <clears throat> moving right along. He says, you, had, you didn't lack, and you knew it was right. And, and I, this part struck me. Why then have you despised the command of the Lord by doing what I consider evil? Not why did you do wrong, not, not, not how did you lose your mind in this deal? Like, not where, what's, what's going, why then have you despised? Have, do you think about that? Do, when's the last time you stepped back and thought about your sin and my sin? When we choose to sin, God considers that as us despising the command and therefore despising him, despising his word, despising God when we sin. He says, why did you do that? Now, David's faced with a simple choice. When you're faced with your sin, when I'm faced with my sin, David's faced with his sin. When the Word of God lays us wide open, we've got two choices, two things we can do. We can excuse and explain, or we can recognize and repent. And David, being the, the guy that he was, he recognized his sin, and he, and he repented, and he said I have sinned against the Lord. Now, many of you know that Psalm 51 correlates with what's happening here. Go read Psalm 51 this week. Spend a little time in your devotion time in Psalm 51. It's David expressing his heart of how awful what he did was, and how unbelievable God is to not have just taken him out right then and there. And in there he says, I have sinned against you and you alone, Lord. We sin against people. Our actions hurt people, but our sin is against the Lord. And David says, I have sinned against you, Lord. But, unbelievably, this gracious, loving, ever abounding in love God that we follow, when we recognize and repent, he causes renewal. Repentance brings renewal. It brings new opportunity. What we die to, God resurrects to life and to new opportunity. David uh, excuse me, the psalmist says in 130 here that if you, Lord, kept a record of sins, Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness so that we can, with reverence, serve you. With God's forgiveness, we get another chance. David's repentance and God's forgiveness, he gets another chance. He doesn't want to lose his son, but David in this renewal, this new opportunity, the, the fact that God didn't say You're, you have to die right now, this new opportunity. He decides to pursue God in prayer. And that's the part of the story that we're focusing on today. David pleaded with God for the boy. He fasted. Notice how those things usually go together. When was the last time you were so... you cared so much about what you were praying for that it coincided with giving up something in order to pray more to God. Have more time and more focus to pray to God. You fasted because what, it, what God was laying on your heart bothered you so much. You fasted and prayed more than just your normal, our normals, just thank you God, good day, thanks for the meal, move on with life. More than that. When's the last time that something stirred your heart that you fasted when you prayed? Or are we at the point 
where we should be out at the battle fighting with our men, and instead, we're sitting back nice and comfortable. I don't need to fast. I don't need to pray. My life's pretty good. David's life was pretty good, too. And the temptation fell on him. He fasted. He went home. He spent the night lying on the ground. It's only a couple times in my life that I have been so burdened by something that I prayed into the night because I couldn't sleep. Have you ever been there? Maybe it woke you up or you couldn't go to sleep in the first place, whatever it was, a mistake you had made, something you were living through, loss, whatever the case may be. That's where David is. He's at that point where his heart is so broken over what he has caused that he can't sleep. He doesn't want to lose his son. No one wants to lose a child. He doesn't want to lose his son. And he knows it's his fault that he's losing his son. He's pleading with God. He's fasting. He can't sleep. He's on his face, lying on the ground. And then on the seventh day, the baby died. Why do I have that up there? Because that's how long David did this. The baby was, it was punished. The baby was born. And for seven days, David didn't eat. David barely slept. David was on his face, begging and pleading with God to please, please not punish me by taking my child. And then he's gone. And they're worried that David is going to commit suicide. That's why they wouldn't tell him. He said he's going to do something desperate. They're worried that if, as, as distraught as David was in this, that now that if they tell him the child is actually gone, he, he's probably going to kill himself. But David picks up on what's going on, and he asked them, they said, yes, he, he is dead. And then the whole thing just flips, right? Right there in verse 20. What does David do? He got up. That's the first thing. What does that mean? He had been laying down on his face, begging God for seven straight days. But now his child is gone, and he gets up from the ground. Wash and anointed himself. He changed his clothes. What is that signifying? When you, when you wash and clean yourself up, what are you doing? You're, you're brushing off the past. Something's new. It's time to move forward. A new beginning. David has repented. David now has begged God. <laughs> Not to be punished in the way that God said he was going to be punished. But now he's been punished. And now the new can begin. He changes his clothes. He's changed. It's something new. And then, don't miss that. Went to the Lord's house and worshipped. Went to the Lord's house and worshipped. The direct opposite of what I would venture to say. You know, they say 80% of statistics are made up on the spot. I'd venture to say 95% of Christians, when they and I and you and us sin, we mess up, we fall away from God, the first place we run away from is the church, is the house of the Lord, is being together to worship together. We run away from it. David, he got up, changed his clothes, changed his mind. Knew his heart was, was back where it was supposed to be. And he went to the Lord's house and worshipped. Christians, Christians that are listening through the camera today, when are we going to come back to the Lord's house and worship? Now, I'm not saying that to put a guilt trip on anyone. I know people have health issues and all that. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about those of us that are like David. We've just gotten kind of comfortable not coming to the Lord's house. It's just kind of easy to sit around and chill. It's kind of easy to pretend and convince myself that sitting there watching a screen is being part of a church. Nothing can be further from the truth. Now, many of the people that are out there are very connected to this church. They are doing what they can do from where they are. They are praying. They are giving they give encouragement. It's unbelievable how connected some of the people that can't physically be here right now still are connected to this church. But that's not who I'm talking about. I'm talking about the people that are like David, should have been out there fighting, but instead they're sitting back chilling. And then he ate. 
you ever fasted? Actually fasted? Not fasted from phone or something. I mean like fasted from food. Have you ever fasted from food? I remember the first time I truly fasted for 24 hours. I thought I was going to die. I wanted to die. I was wishing for death. I had made a commitment to do it, so I couldn't go back on it. I was like, God, I'd, I'd, rather than break this oath, I'd rather you just kill me. I want food, right? The first time I fasted for 24 hours, I thought about the fact that Jesus fasted for 40 days, and I said, that, of all the things Jesus did, other than be on the cross, that is the most impressive thing that Jesus did to me after I had fasted for 24 hours. And David ate. His fast was over. It was time to move forward. Seven days on his face, no sleep, no food. He doesn't sit around after pleading with God and say, but God, I asked you not to do this. God, I was begging you. I fasted even, right? Sometimes we think if we fast, then that means God's got to answer our prayers. No, God just wants your heart. But God, I was, is that what he does? No, he picks himself up. He changes. He goes and worships. He eats. He trusts God's promises. That's what David does. That's what's in the truth of what he's doing right there. He begs God to not do what he says he's going to do. And when he doesn't answer his prayer the way he wants him to, he trusts that God is still good. He trusts that God is still who he says he is. He picks himself up, he changes his clothes, he worships, and he, he's going to move forward. And then, here's us, verse 21. This is us in this story. What? What? <laughs> what are you doing, David? We are confused. Like, confused. You were distraught beside yourself. On the brink of death, you were praying so much, praying so hard. And now the child's actually gone, and you just get up and move on like everything's okay? And David tells him right there. He said, hey, I thought, who knows? I don't know what God's going to do. You don't know what God's going to do. Be careful of putting God's name on something that you think he's doing, but maybe he's not. we got to be, whoa, first commandment. Don't take the Lord's name in vain. Don't take the Lord's name in vain. Don't put his name on God's name. David said, I don't know. Who knows? I mean, God's loving. God's graceful. He's merciful. I know who he is. Maybe it was just, you know, these seven days is what I was going to have to go through. Maybe God was going to let him live. But he didn't. So now what am I going to do? He's gone. My son, that I didn't even get the name, is gone. And then catch this truth. Catch this hope right here. Verse 23. It says, he's not coming back to me, but I'll go to him. <laughs> How do you pick yourself up, Christian, when, when, it's, when, it's, when you don't think you can? When, the hope, like we talked about last week, the hope of the resurrection. The hope of eternity with God. And how do we know that that's what David is talking about right there? There's some, there's some uh, critics and, and naysayers out there that say that well, that's not what David means right here. David's just talking about joining him in the grave. He's not talking about joining him in heaven and eternity. Huh. Scripture answers Scripture. This is David in his own words in Psalm 23, 6. I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. David doesn't say, I'm going to go dwell in the grave forever. David's not going to go be with his son in the grave forever. He's going to be in the house of the Lord forever with his son. What a great, great hope. David expects eternity, and he expects to see his son there. We know that. This is where David knew he was going to be, and he knew this is where his son already was. Now, that's great. A lot of truth in that story. A lot of things going on. But it's kind of like if, if, if it were a movie and the movie ended there, you'd be walking out as the credits were rolling going, I'm not really sure I like that story. <laughs> you ever had a movie like that? You walk out it's like, so I had my seven bucks back. That was a waste of time. The ending was terrible, right? A good mo a movie can be terrible but have a great ending and, and you feel like you got your money's worth. Kind of a bad ending. Well, it doesn't. Obviously, it doesn't end there. It moves on. It goes forward there. This is after the sun has passed. It said, then David comforted his wife, Bathsheba. He went and slept with her. She gave birth to a son, 
and named him Solomon. The Lord loved him, Solomon, and because the Lord loved him, he sent word through Nathan the prophet to name him Jedidiah. There's nine months worth of hope and forgiveness and mercy and grace in two verses right here. David comforts his wife, Bathsheba. Did you catch that? What did God call Bathsheba in verse 15? He certainly didn't call him David's wife. What did he call him? What did he call her? Go back to verse 15 and look, if you still got your word open. It's Uriah's wife, right? I'm going to take your son that's coming from Uriah's wife, right? But now David has repented, and God has forgiven and a new beginning has come. And now, God calls Bathsheba David's wife. Whew. What a God. And then, <clears throat> don't miss the importance of the son living for seven days. In the, the Jewish custom of the time in Israel, on the eighth day, what would they have done with this son? They would have circumcised him and they would have named him. Right? They would have got to name him. They didn't get to name him. Here's, here's our God. David now has Bathsheba as his wife. Here's a blessing moving forward, right? Here's a blessing moving forward. He didn't do it right, right? Some of us are like that, right? Had a divorce or two or three, right? But then God blesses and it moves forward, right? Man, what a God. He's blessing and moving forward. And this son that they did not even get to name, now check this. Now God gives this son two names. Two names. She gave birth to a son and named him Solomon, which is close to the Shalom, right? This is peace. This son is peace. He has brought peace to Bathsheba's heart. Solomon has. And then it says that God loved this child, and he sent word through Nathan to name him Jedidiah. What does Jedidiah mean? Some of you in your notes, it probably tells you. Beloved of the Lord, right? What does David mean? Beloved. That's pretty cool. David's name means beloved. Now he's had a son, Jedidiah, loved by the Lord. God is infinite in his mercy and his grace. Through your wickedness and my wickedness, our sin, our rebellion, our despising of his word, he is unbelievable to be compassionate and merciful moving forward. What a truth. What a truth. Again, David focused on the promise not the expl explanation. He focused on the promise, not the explanation. Now, here's what I want to do, and we're almost done. Psalm 86, we're fixing to look at, is words from David. And I think I'm going to commit this, try to commit this chapter to memory. It is basically a daily prayer in a chapter of Psalms. And we're just going to look at the first seven verses uh, and pull out what a prayer can look like when you're praying to God for his promises and not for explanations. Hear me, Lord, and answer me, for I am poor and needy. Guard my life, for I am faithful to you. Save your servant who trusts in you. You are my God. Have mercy on me, Lord, for I call to you all day long. Bring joy to your servant, Lord, for I put my trust in you. You, Lord, are forgiving and good, abounding in love to all who call to you. Hear my prayer, Lord. Listen to my cry for mercy. When I am in distress... I call to you because you answer me. I don't have them all highlighted. I have most of them highlighted, but I'm going to highlight some things to pull out of there that are promises. Lord, you are forgiving. He is good. He's abounding in love. Verse 6, he listens. Verse 7, he answers. Now, that's a prayer. That's a prayer that is praying to God through his promises. What do I mean by his promises? God's promises are God's character. His promises will never fail. If you pray with the desire for always having an explanation, you will live a miserable prayer life. God doesn't always give us an explanation, and God certainly doesn't owe you or me an explanation. That's where we got to get our heart checked and start on the on the forefront of the prayer life correctly i'm not going to god so god can explain himself to me god doesn't owe you anything or me he gives us more than we deserve but he doesn't owe us anything pray to him through his 
promises, not with expectations of explanations. So I'm going to give you 12 promises of God with Scripture, and we'll finish up. Things that you can pray and be comforted in knowing when you're praying to God. Pray through these truths. God's presence, I will never leave thee. God's protection, I am thy shield. God's power, I will strengthen thee. God's provision, I will help thee. God's leading, and when he putteth forth his own sheep, he goeth before them. God's purposes, I know the thoughts that I think towards you, saith the Lord. Thoughts of peace and not of evil. God's rest, come unto me, all ye who labor and are heavy laden, I will give you rest. God's cleansing, I, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. God's goodness, no good thing he will withhold from them that work uprightly. God's faithfulness, the Lord will not forsake his people for his great name's sake. Not for you, but for him. God's guidance, the meek he will guide. God's wise plan, all things work together for the good to them that love God. Now, if you need help praying to God through his promises, there's you an example of things that you can pray and be confident in his goodness and confident in his provision and confident in his leadership and know that he is who he says he is even when you don't get the explanation you want or even when you don't get an explanation at all for what it is you're praying about or praying through so here's what we'll finish up with pursue God in prayer through his promises why because faith is grown through trusting in God's promises not in receiving explanations no amount of information is going to grow your faith. No amount of information is going to change your life. Faith, which is trust and obedience in who God is. Faith in Jesus, who is God. Faith is going to change your life and change your heart. And faith is trusting in God's promises. So set your focus. Pursue. Dioko, chase down and capture. God in your prayer life. Chase down and capture him through his promises. Not your desire, his. Not your explanations, faith. Not doubt in circumstance. Not doubt in circumstance, but faith in his promises. And we've said this many times before, and I'll, and I'll finish with this. This church will not do any more than what takes place through the men's prayer lives of the leadership of this church. The men who lead this church, the prayer life of those men will set and determine the direction and the level to which we reach the calling that God has placed on this church. That includes me, and that includes many of you. And most of the time we don't have to include women in that because they're already beating down the prayer door way more than we are. I'll pray for us.